Welcome everyone, let's get started. I'm Rebecca Slayton. I'm a professor in the Science and Technology Studies Department at Cornell University. This year I am also a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences here at Stanford. I'm delighted to be here and delighted to welcome you all to this event where we'll be celebrating and learning more about the history and current significance of public key cryptography. So today public key cryptography provides the primary basis for secure communication over the internet. It enables electronic commerce, secure software updates, online work, government services, much more. Um, but it has not always been widely available. In the early 1970s, the US government monopolized cryptography by keeping it highly classified. Now that changed in the mid 1970s when computer scientists Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman, who are here with us today, uh, re, or re invented public key cryptography, publicly invented public key cryptography and demonstrated its potential. Um, their work enabled a few things that were not previously possible. So I'll just start by highlighting a few contributions so everybody is on the same page here. First, they developed the concept of asymmetric cryptography, which enables secret communications over insecure channels between parties that have never met. So the essence of this is that crypto cryptographic keys are split into public and private components. Anyone can send a secure message to someone by encrypting it with the recipient's public key, but then the recipient needs their private key to decrypt it. Um, and second, they propose the concept of digital signatures, which enables the authentication of communications. So just to put this in an everyday context, the, the idea of secret communications, if you're thinking about writing a check to somebody, uh, the secrecy would allow you to not let anybody see what is the amount of that check. The authentication makes sure that nobody can forge a check. And in a lot of contexts, we actually care more about the second thing, right? Not letting anybody forge a check or say claim to be us when they are not. And we need to know that other people are who they say they are, that communications are from the people that they claim to be from. And then the third major contribution was two methods for establishing shared symmetric keys, including Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which is still widely used. Um, so in 2015, the Association for Computing Machinery awarded Diffie and Hellman the Turing Award, which is computer science's highest honor for their work on public key cryptography. Um, Witt and Marty also made public key cryptography widely accessible and, and had other uh, impacts in terms of helping develop an open community of cryptographers, um, influencing public policy. They had also had significant impact, as I learned in the process of editing this book, on theoretical computer science and on mathematics. And this is where I get to plug the book that occasions the event for today, this very heavy, uh, wonderful book that was just published by the Association for Computing Machinery. Um, now I'm going to do something that the publisher probably will not like, which is to tell you that you can get this for free um, online, virtual version, so that you don't have to carry around something heavy all the time. This is the listing in the, the Stanford catalog. It's online. Um, and if you were to click on this uh, link right here at the ACM Digital Library, if you have access to the digital library through any other um, library besides Stanford, or because you're a member of ACM, you can go to this page and download click on the red button and download a PDF copy for free. So, and then you don't have to carry around something that will <laughs> make, make your arm, arm very sore. Um, okay, so the publisher might not like that, but I thought you all should know. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our panel. Um, we have a distinguished panel today to discuss, uh, teach us more about the significance of public key cryptography. I'll also take off my mask, mask so that you can hear me a little bit better. Um, and uh, I will just introduce them very, very briefly. We'll go um, in the order that they're listed here. Um, we will have time after that, we'll give uh, Marty and Witt a chance to respond to their comments and we'll open it up to discussion. Um, John uh, Markoff has uh, very generously agreed to moderate that part of uh, the event. So we'll start with Andre Broder, who is a distinguished scientist at Google. And I'll turn it over to him. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, is a is a pleasure uh, to be here. I, I think I met Marty's. Well, let's not say how many years ago, but uh, he was uh, teaching at Stanford when I was uh, the PhD program. <laughs> um, so long, long ago. Uh, and uh, I, uh, as uh, you might have mentioned, I also had the honor to. Uh, present Kim's uh, Turing Award on behalf of uh, Google that is a sponsor of, uh, of the award. Um, 
So one thing I like to uh, focus on that actually um, you already heard a little bit is the importance of public key cryptography for the web and uh, especially for the birth of the web. So I think that the web is uh, probably the defining artifact of our century so far. Uh, it certainly completely changed uh, not only the technology, but, but society in, in many different ways. So if you look back how it happened, it's interesting like many other um, technological advances, it needed a lot of ingredients that somehow by magic they were already there when, when they were needed. And uh, the, like many other technological advances, I think the biggest problem with an idea is the cold start problem. You know, how do people, many ideas would work great if enough people would embrace them, but no one embraces them because there is not enough of other people doing it. You know, there can be a, a great uh, restaurant, but no one is going there because uh, you never heard about it and you haven't heard about it because no one is, is getting there. So that's a standard cold start problem and almost all ideas uh, fail because of the cold start. However, the web didn't. And so I like to go a little bit back and, and say, since uh, you know, my, my career uh, pretty much spans exactly the life of the web and I've been involved in many, many things there, how this, how this happened. So a lot of times you're gonna hear, I think that uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web, um, which is some, you know, but there can be many other, many other starting point. What happened is that Tim Berners-Lee who was a CERN at the time put together two ideas that already were, were common. One was uh, hypertext ideas, ideas that you have text, but also the text can link to other pieces of text or other pieces of information that becomes hypertext. And internet, uh, which was a connection system uh, in, you know, which uh, Stanford was actually quite uh, quite involved. Uh, Vin Cerf was at Stanford was one of the founders of, of the internet as a means of communication between machines and, and creating large networks of communication. On this one was built ARPANET and then internet and so on. But anyway, at this point, we are roughly uh, late eighties, early nineties, uh, the hypertext and internet are put together at, uh, at CERN, and uh, I think uh, mostly it was for, for exchanging uh, scientific information and a lot of universities came along and they also were there, but it was still a fairly small club. <laughs> and the big breakthrough, what to start making it from a small club and, uh, and started the really the explosive uh, growth uh, was actually the Netscape browser, it was mosaic. And, and the big change was that instead of saying, well, now here is a page and the page has a pointer to an image. And then you download the image and you look at it on, on, on your screen, <laughs> assuming that you are or one of the few people that have a, a terminal that can display graphics. But, uh, or, or play music or anything like that. Um, the big innovation was, you know, this can be part of the browsing experience. So for the users that doesn't know anything, this makes so much simpler, everything is integrated. So that makes it quite attractive at, uh, at the user level, but still, you know, there were all sorts of costs. There was a bandwidth cost to all the stories. There was an access cost because you need terminals and you need all those things. So, so how in such sort of long odds, how does this cold start problem happen to work? Well, there were a bunch of things that also luckily were, were around. The, the ethernet as a means of communication make, make things cheaper Then there was uh, in the, by the mid 90s or um, optic fibers, it can be used for, for the main uh, network connecting computer. So that was good. 
PCs were popular. People had people had personal computers at home as they were connected through modems and and all that. So some of those uh, solved this problem. But still, uh, this was to at, at the consumer level. This was mostly uh, uh, you know you have to pay a subscription. There was a certain uh, it was a certain amount of disposable income to do all that and and then you know there was no business yet on the on the internet and the thing that made finally and this was uh, uh what started the you know the infamous dot com bubble so there were a couple of things one was uh in terms of technology was search search very large scale search became possible. Uh, Alta Vista was the first uh, very large scale uh, search engine that indexed every word on the web, quote unquote. Not, it was never true, but it was perceived as such. Um, and, uh, you know, the technology was ready. It, it was built with nothing to do with the web. It, it, in the very beginning of it, it was built because uh, lexicographers from Oxford wanted to search corpora much larger than what was thought as a large corpus. Uh, you know, a large corpus, even in mid eighties was 50,000 documents. That was the large corpus. Uh, and was, uh, you know, the National uh, Bureau of Standards had a challenge based on search over 50,000 documents. So that was one uh, one aspect, and uh, and then uh, the other the other uh, aspects of the search technology was there. So that creates an incentive to create content. So then suddenly there was a way which will uh, definitely erode this this way. There was a way to make money on the web and to provide money to the people that make content and this was advertising so advertising was essential because essentially the advertising was a way of making money and and creates an incentive to be there and then it created the search plus advertising creating the incentive for commercial uh enterprises to be on the web and a lot of transactions could move on the web so finally we come to where we need cryptography we need for all this to work so you have you have this uh, uh, synergy between between content search with advertising paying both for content and for search but now you finally need the business to happen i mean advertising is not interesting unless you can sell something so for the business to happen, you need to have transactions. And for the transaction to happen, the transaction has to be secure. So at this point, finally, people were very happy because we had a way of doing secure transactions on the web at very little cost. And it was, by the way, technically important that it was easy to generate keys. One, one problem uh, in terms of many protocols, uh, is you know the protocol might be might be might be good, but if you but if it's hard to generate secrets and keys, then then it might not work in in all cases. So you had this this important ingredient that we can do secure transactions. So suddenly you have a lot of people being simultaneously interested to be to be on the web. You have the merchants that can be on the web and they can sell on the web because there are secure protocols. Uh, you have the people that want to generate and output movies or pictures or, or write blogs and they can make, some of them might be volunteer, but some of them want to make money, they can make money through advertising. You have search engines that can also make money through advertising. And socially, uh, advertising ultimately is not paid by the advertiser, it's paid by the people that buy things. So in other words, it's paid by the people that have large disposable income and they subsidize the whole thing. So you can have free access for a poor kid in, in India to be you know, the next Ramanujan uh, because uh, 
you know, relatively well-off people uh, buy uh, you know, lots of things they don't really need on the web. Uh, but but uh, uh, this works, and uh, and the result is whole flywheel starting to turn very very rapidly. So you had in the in the mid uh, you know in the mid nineties, uh, of course there were a few more other ingredients like compression, JPEG and MPEG that make things things uh, fly faster, and they flew faster roughly until two thousand, but it all crashed. <laughs> then it started again and so on but we still have public key cryptography is an ingredient if you look at the ecosystem of the web public key cryptography is still a, an essential ingredient uh and uh you know probably your browser bugs you whenever you try to access anything through http rather than https which is the access secure access method which is uses okay i you know, I'm not the most qualified to go into all the technicalities, but yeah, it uses sort of SSL and somewhere behind it and behind this is the DT Hellman variant and, and all that. But uh, not only became something that allows you, but in fact, if you not use it, uh, uh, you, you start becoming restricted in what you can see and do on the web. So here we are. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> so now I will turn it over to Susan Landau, who is Bridge Professor in Cybersecurity and Policy at the Fletcher School and the School of Engineering in the Department of Computer Science at Tufts University. Thank you. So I'm going to start with a story, which is I wrote a book with Wit um, in the mid late 1990s on public key cryptography, but it was about policy issues. And Wit and I had been on an ACM committee uh, about uh, the Clipper chip, which was a government project uh, to provide cryptography, strong cryptography at the time uh, for digital telephony, but the keys were going to be split and held by agencies of the federal government. This was not a project that, that many in the United States were happy with, and many outside the United States were particularly not happy with it. But when, when this project, when this idea was floated, and it was John who broke the story, uh, when this idea was was put forth, it looked like it might have legs. And so ACM put together a study and uh, I was on the study as a staff member. I then I fairly quickly became first author, uh, thanks to machinations by, by people like my friend over here. But all, uh, but Whit was on the committee and it was one of those committee reports where not only did the conclusions have to be argued to death, but every paragraph had to be argued to death. And Witt said to me at the end of this, well, why don't we write a book? It'll take us, he either said three months or six months. I don't <laughs> and I said, gee, I don't know. And when I said, yes, I'd like to, he said, gee, I don't know. And we went back and forth like this for months. And then one day I came home and there was- Three or six months. <laughs> uh, one day I came home and there was this FedEx package. So I opened up the FedEx package and it was a secure, Tele it was a secure a device to do secure telephony. And I turned to my husband and I said, I guess I'm doing the book with wit. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't actually need the device, but he wanted me to be using it all the time so I would know what it was like. He eventually got me to also get a, a US government one that Sun supplied. And uh, I think we only used that a couple of times. But I remember when Sun asked for it back and I took it to the UPS store and the UPS store was treating me like a, a boring middle-aged woman until he said to me, uh, and what's in the package? And, and, and I said that it was a, uh, oh God, now what am I? Uh, Stu three. Stu three, it was a Stu three. <laughs> looked at me, California. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he looked at me and he said, you have a Stu three? And I suddenly became a very important person in Amherst, Massachusetts. <laughs> so, but that aside, that's how I know wit. And, and I can tell you many more wit stories, but over drinks. Um, the, the thing I want to talk about is the time in the 70s when everything was really delicate. And, and Andre alluded to some of that. Um, and that's, of course, when Witt and Marty came up with their, their things. And um, so we all know about them doing lots of keynotes, pushing for public key to be widely used, Witt doing lots of testimony in Congress and so on. But for those of you who didn't pay attention in the 1970s and for those of you who weren't around, um, we, of course, had things like uh, the Nixon administration taping, wiretapping people that he illegally wiretapping. We had the church committee, which exposed the 
NSA, the Army, the FBI, the CIA conducting surveillance domestically. And then what we also had is that pub as public key was developed, as public key was developed, first we had, there was a letter that mysteriously appeared uh, that was sent to Ruvesh Shamir and Edelman who came up with the second public key algorithm, uh, a letter that said that if they presented their work at a, an IEEE conference in Ithaca, uh, they would be in violation of ITAR, International Traffic in, in Arms Regulation, because foreigners would be at the meeting. <laughs> Everybody started looking at, I guess you guys got it too, yeah, because- actually, that, that, that was the IEEE conference, it was me and uh, uh, Steve Pollard and uh, Ralph Merkel, not RSA. The letter went to the, went to, went to the, 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 the letter went to the but, Okay, and, um, and nobody knew what to do. Uh, science reporters discovered that it was J.A. Meyer, an employee of NSA who sent it out. I discovered while, while doing the writing for this book that that letter went out the first week and in fact, the first couple of days that, uh, that Bobby Inman was a, a director of NSA. So NSA had made the claim that it was not an official letter given the timing, I suspect that's true, but it certainly had a chilling effect. There's no question it had a chilling effect on the research. There was a lot of other stuff that had a chilling effect. Uh, Len Edelman, who was one of RSA, had applied for NSF funding and all of a sudden he gets mail saying, or a call, because we didn't do mail in those days, at least not the way we do it now. Uh, it used to come in paper in those days, um, that, that NSA would be willing to fund him. Excuse me, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and so we all know about those stories because those stories became public. There was a science reporter who was very diligent about reporting all of that. Some of those stories actually also made it onto the front pages of the New York Times. I did that reporter I ended up in the New York Times, but that's another story. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but there's actually a lot more that was going on. So there, were, there was a public discussion at Berkeley that, uh, that Inman gave and then he drove down to, to meet Marty. And I'm not gonna tell Marty's story. Marty can tell it at some point if he wants about the two of them coming much closer to each other than they expected in the sense that both of them figured out the other one did not have horns. That's, that's what, what uh, I think Marty told me. Um, but Inman was meanwhile going around to various government agencies. He went to the Office of Naval Research and he told them, and they had funded Rivest, he told them that, N, that ONR was not to fund cryptographic research without first getting NSA approval. Uh, there were fights about whether NSF, people would show up in the NSF funding office and say things like, you know, um, you can't really fund this unless NSA has looked at it, or we're happy to review it for you. In fact, we need to review it for you. Um, these questions, these issues got elevated to Frank Press, who was the White House science advisor at the time. Um, and then they seemed to die down after uh, the American Council of Education, or I think you were on the report? I wasn't, but I, I was involved. Uh, the American Council of Education did an NSF funded study that essentially came out with a recommendation that, that, science, that it, there should be a voluntary program for scientists to, to submit papers to the NSA but it should be voluntary. Interestingly, the math community said, there is this report and this is the recommendation, we are agnostic. Computer science, the ACM was not agnostic. It said, we recommend that you submit papers. So this was the atmosphere, late seventies, early eighties. There was another thing that happened in the early eighties, something that I discovered while reading this book which is that there was a um, NSDD, I think it was an NSDD, I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm not sure though. There was in any case an order that all cryptography research funded by the government, which meant contractors and academics need to be considered as national security items and, and are potentially classifiable. Now, not surprising for the federal contractors, they'd already been operating under such a system. But that is a pretty chilling effect on academic research. The NSF general counsel at the time said that as far as she knows, it was, uh, well, we do know that there were none that were ever classified. Uh, but she also pointed out to me that this was a case where the onus was on private citizens to decide that their work was classifiable, a very strange and chilling effect. 
So then you get Witt and Marty, who um, <laughs> they did more than stumble them. This was no stumbling. Uh, you can pretend it was stumbling. It wasn't stumbling. Um, stumbling. <laughs> so I am a, uh, a theoretical computer scientist who became a policy wonk, partially due to, to this man to my right, to my left. Um, uh, who hired me at Sun to be two thirds technical and one third policy, and I became 100% policy. But um, computer scientists, technologists, mathematicians like to take the techniques they have and say, what problems can we solve with these techniques? Witt and Marty did not do that. Witt and Marty said, what problem needs to be solved? What problem needs to be solved so that the internet, whenever it exists 20 or 30 years from now, can work? It can enable two entities who have never met to exchange a key so that they can have a secret communication. It's a very different way of doing research. It's not, how can I use my tool to, to knock down one more problem? It's, there is this problem. Now do we have any tools that can do it? Um, Witt likes to tell the story that, uh, or at least I've heard him tell once the story that, that he had the idea of public key, and then he was thirsty, he went downstairs to the fridge to get a Coke, and when he came up, he'd forgotten it. <laughs> and so when he moved into his new- He came very close on the stairs. <laughs> so when he, when he had a study in, in the house that he moved into in the 1990s or early 2000s, he had a fridge put into the study. Uh, so that problem has not occurred again. Uh, but that's a really important thing that they framed the problem and said, how do we solve it? It's had tremendous impact. It's had the impact it's had, Andre mentioned some, I'll mention them on a, on a very different sphere and very different playing field. We wouldn't have Tor, the onion router, which allows uh, private, private connections across the network, private web browsing, so that when I go to a web page, Nobody can tell, none of the internet routers along the way can tell what page I'm looking at. Very important uh, for people in, um, in, ris in, in risky situations. It allows uh, Signal, which is encrypted telephone communications. It allows WhatsApp, which is encryption for the masses. This is really important. It's important for human rights. It's important for journalists. It's important for people in domestic violence situations. Um, we wouldn't have that without public key. But there's another part that is equally important. When I think about this, I think about the physicists from uh, the 1940s, where they suddenly figured out that, oh no, they weren't just doing physics, they had invented a horrific bomb and that they had to get involved in public policy. The biologists had this happening as, as genome editing became a possibility. Uh, Witt and Marty, with their work, were really well aware of that issue at the time of the 1970s because of the political stuff that was happening from NSA and the pressure from the government. But they also took action. They began responding to it. And interestingly enough, there's a whole cadre of people that, de uh, that developed those interests and, and capabilities around that time. But the really interesting part, which we sort of figured out over time, is that all of them came from New York City. <laughs> Marty and I actually went to the same high school some years apart, but all of them came from New York City. I don't know what was in the water. The water comes from the Catskill Mountains. <laughs> Can't tell, but... but Jewish come from Eastern Europe. I'm <laughs> <laughs> but we weren't all Jewish. <laughs> but um, but they, they developed this model of how computer scientists were going to get involved in policy issues. And it's had a lasting legacy. And we see that legacy in other fields of computer science now, like the AI fairness issues and, and the models we've had for how to engage. Um, but it all started with these two. So thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now I'll turn it over to John Markoff, who's an award-winning author and journalist, spent many years at the New York Times. Thank you. Um, so it's now been more than a decade since I basically walked away from writing about computer security and cryptography. Um, there was this moment where I decided that if I wrote one more story about a testosterone poisoned teenager with an attitude, I was going to have an aneurysm. Mm. I'd written the same story at that point too many times, and I had to find something else to do. And so I walked away with, from what became one of the best stories uh, in the world, um, uh, cyber warfare. Uh, these days, I mostly confine myself to um, following uh, websites like 
Web3 is going just great.com. I commend it to you. Um, like the word hacker, uh, which at one point meant one thing and then meant another thing. Um, the word crypto has gone from meaning one thing to another thing. And now <laughs> to most people's mind, I'm sure it means cryptocurrency money, which is interesting. Um, essentially, I came back to Silicon Valley in 1977, the year after uh, public key was invented. And uh, I had decided I wanted to become a reporter. Um, and I was freelancing. Uh, there was this personal computer industry that was merging. There were these computer networks that were merging. Uh, early on, I read a book um, by Christopher Evans, who was a British journalist called The Micro Millennium. And um, uh, Evans argued that the microprocessor was going to change the world. And I thought, well, that probably is a good beat. Um, I'll, I'll write about microprocessors. And I basically did that for the rest of my career. Um, but early on, if you were around uh, the Mid Peninsula, um, everything was in the air. Um, I, I was close to some people at Xerox Park, so I had early sort of sense of where the, the, the world was going. Uh, the Alto was a prototype. There was an Ethernet network. Um, John Schock had, had, had written a worm. You could see immediately that things were bubbling. I was reading um, cyberpunk uh, science fiction as it emerged. And then I was writing about the things and I was seeing that life was imitating art. Um, early on when I was at a little publication called InfoWorld, um, I wrote about, uh, was the first um, uh, bulletin board bus. It was called 8BBS. It was a hobbyist uh, bulletin board that was committed to the freedom of information that was on El Camino Real. And one day, an interagency task force of uh, eight different uh, you know, police agencies broke down this poor guy's um, door in his apartment and took away this eight, uh, PEP-8 computer that was running this bulletin board service. And that was sort of the window into the way things were going. I, I think I probably wrote the very first article about cyber warfare. Um, it showed up in a magazine called Mother Jones in 1981. Um, I had discovered that there was a backdoor in the ARPANET, um, uh, uh, an institute called IASA, a math institute in uh, Austria, I think, uh, was connected to the ARPANET. And there was a 9,600 baud motor line to Moscow. <laughs> and somebody at ARPA told, uh, told me about that. And his joke was, well, maybe we'll all settle it with a giant space war game. <laughs> and I think IASA lost their funding for a while because the Reagan administration thought that this was something very horrible. Um, about seven years later, uh, the Morris Worm was really a moment in time. It was really the first time that the broader public realized the power of networks, both for good and ill. And because I, I knew um, the father of the author, um, uh, Robert Morris Sr. I, I was the person who identified Robert Tappan Morris, and um, but it really reframed where the, this stuff was going. The Morris, Morris Worm was this program that basically stalled this then new um, internet. It had just become the internet, and um, it was a, 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 it was a real signal of things to come. Um, I stayed in touch with Morris Sr., who at that point was uh, the chief scientist at part of the National Security Agency. Um, he was never really, I wouldn't call him a source, but it was somebody I had conversations with over a, a long period of time. And at one point he said something that was very interesting to me and it framed the way I looked at cryptography after that. Um, he was at that point, this is not quite sure when this, this conversation was, probably in the early 90s, probably before the web. Um, Robert Morris Sr. was called in regularly by the FBI to help them when they had problems breaking encryption in criminal investigations. And he asserted to me, and I don't know if this is true, but he asserted to me that there was a never a case where he came as a consultant where he wasn't able to get access to the plain text of the information he was looking for. And it was because always the crypto systems, the criminals or the you know, possible criminals were, using, were, were not used properly. And because they were not used properly, properly they were vulnerable. And that, that was very interesting because I realized <laughs> It was not just about technology, but there was this messy human stuff that surrounded the technology that became part of the <laughs> equation. Um, I did get involved in the clipper chip story, um, at which was at the point at, at which basically an, uh, an, uh, an industry existed and a uh, activist community was emerging, this, this, this group that called themselves the cyber, cypherpunks. I saw that I ended up writing um, 118 articles on crypto over the years of the New York Times. Early on, I, I wrote something about uh, a, a young uh, hacker, by, then young hacker by the name of John Gilmore, who was always quarreling with the NSA and sort of in their face and sort of defined the, the, the terms. Um, 
I guess it was in 1990 that the NSA lost authority over civilian computer security. So this industry really began, began emerging. Um, so in, in, in 1992, um, uh, two Bell, uh, Bellcore research, Bell Labs researchers, um, Haber and Sternetta created the blockchain. Um, that led to an interesting uh, moment. Uh, so the blockchain was originally created because people were moving from paper uh, scientific journals to digital scientific journals. And these guys began wondering about how would you verify the, the existence of a particular invention or certify it. And, and they came up with this digital blockchain. Shortly after my article appeared, they decided they wanted to set up a company. And uh, they, they created this company and then they needed a place in the public to put this number that they were gonna publish at regular uh, moments. And so they went to the classified ad department of the New York Times and, and uh, you know, said that we wanna take out a weekly ad or maybe it was daily, I can't remember, it was weekly initially, I think. And the, uh, the, the classified ad people said, well, you guys are bookies, we're not gonna take this from you guys. And so they wouldn't let them place the ad. So I had to go to the publisher and explain to them that these guys were actually, you know, they had a business idea in mind. The Times was always a little far behind. Um, so this, you know, this this division, these cyber wars emerged during the, the 1990s, as, as as Susan said, and it set the framework. Um, for me, it was always about um, it was always about culture as well as 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 politics. And I went and, and found, I mean, uh, this technology emerged in part out of this this culture, this hacker culture. And um, one of the attributes of that, that, uh, that culture was this restaurant in Palo Alto called Sinan, um, where the, the hacker community sort of was, was, uh, was centered uh, during, a, during a period during, during the 70s. I, I just wanted to read the, the, the beginning and the end of that article, which sort of gives you a, a flavor of that world. Um, this is when Sinan closed down, which was, at its last location was a town and country uh, in, I think in the 1990s. I wrote this in 1999. In the mid 1970s, the social nucleus of many of the men who were creating both the internet and the personal computer industry was a hole in the wall Sichuan restaurant across the street from Stanford University. Theirs was an informal network included people like John McCarthy, a pioneer of artificial intelligence and Whitfield Diffie, an inventor of modern cryptography who was then a Stanford graduate student and carried a custom, custom chopsticks. Bill Gosper, a mathematician and legendary computer hacker ate at the restaurant every evening for a decade. So, and, and one of the things about, for a reporter, it was just a gold mine because everybody in a, who had a startup would put their, <laughs> would, put their would, would put their business card on the wall and you could sort of keep track of, of what was starting, uh, who was starting what. I, I concluded this article with this uh, anecdote. Um, um, Jeff Rubin, a systems program at Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory even worked for Mr. Cal, who was the, the a proprietor as a waiter in exchange for Chinese lessons, which is why Mark Seiden, a veteran programmer, remembers one day when a manager of the laboratory came in, came to lunch with a digital equipment salesman. At one point, the two were arguing about a technical detail and the manager, call, manager called a halt to the debate. There is no point in arguing, he said. We can settle this very easily. Let's ask the waiter. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us about the cache of a KL-10? The laboratory man manager asked Mr. Rubin. He responded, it's a 32 a 32K two-way ascetic associative cash and walked away, leaving the salesman's mouth hanging again. <laughs> so I'm sure there are many other good stories that seem to see on. So there you go. Okay, fantastic. So thank you all. So now let's give um, Marty Witt a chance to respond to anything that you'd like that's been raised, um, anything that you want to make sure we discuss, and then we'll be open to questions. I should say that, um, well, I'll wait. There's, there are already uh, questions queuing up on Zoom. So just to let you know, um, maybe five, 10 minutes max, we make sure we have time to talk. You know, I thought the great thing, oh, I thought the great thing about uh, Ruben was he told me he was just invisible. People would have highly, you know, <laughs> proprietary conversation stations that they didn't want within a foot of him. And it never occurred to them that the waiter who, among other things, had an incredible memory, it was absorbing all of this stuff. Unfortunately, his principles prevented him from making proper use of that to uh, have, a, have a much more ill-founded fortune. Than um, I want to say you said nobody knew what to do at, at Cornell. I knew exactly what to do. I had read, I had read 
Kafka's book, The Trial. And you be when you when you are assaulted by a, by a, an apparent allegedly legal mechanism with no validity, you immediately defy it. And I scheduled a talk in the rump session, which I had the best I could do uh, about a new topic to defy the uh, the demands. Unfortunately, I didn't follow up the topic, which was later called ping pong protocol. <laughs> Made a career for two other people. Um, so I guess I want to say it's, it's you know it's really rare to set out to do something and achieve it. And in the late 1960s, I was I was working at the well being hosted by the AI lab at MIT, and we were in the building with Multics, which is the greatest operating system project of all time. Unix is kind of its derivative, and. <clears throat> They had all sorts of security mechanisms. And I looked at them and I thought, you know, I thought of it as the system programmers. Now maybe you'd say the operators. Your file is protected. The operators aren't going to not give it to the police, right? You need to do something that will protect the stuff independent of other people's actions. And the only thing I knew was encryption. And I didn't know anything much about it. And I thought I was working on more important issues at that point. I was moving, I was working on symbolic mathematical manipulation with an eye on proof of correctness of programs. Uh, and I remember saying to, uh, talking about my, I said to Roland Silver, who was my mentor at the time, look, NSA knows all this stuff and they won't tell us to us. I think we need to rediscover it. And he said, well, that might be more difficult than you think. There are a lot of very smart people working down there. But the fact is that has, a, Exactly that has been achieved. Not that we know everything NSA knows. The most important thing turns out to be having the problems to work on. And you don't really discover cryptanalysis in the way they do it unless you have access to traffic. And for anybody who didn't know, at getting the traffic is 90% of the cost, right? I mean, cryptography is a few hundred, cryptanalysis is a few hundred people down there, and the other. $20 billion goes to flying satellites and things like that. But the point is, it turned out to be true. And over, you know, we, we public, I believe that the public expertise in cryptography is as great as any in the world. Um, what happened, and you can shout me down when you get bored, uh, is in 1972, all of this got made actual for me by a pure accident. Which is Larry Roberts, who was funding the ARPANET, went up to NSA to talk to Howard Rosenblum, who was the director of research, with a very obvious proposition. Here, I have a $100 million a year military communications research project. We should think about security. As far as I can tell from secondary sources, they must have agreed about that. But what they couldn't agree about was that Robert's part of ARPA, rare, I mean, rare part of ARPA, didn't want to support secret work. Howard Rosenbaum didn't want to do anything else. So Roberts goes back to his office in Roslyn, and he's got this great job, right? He hands out money. So his principal investigators come by with their hats in their hands, and they have to listen to anything he wants to talk about. And that week he was talking about network security, which we then saw as synonymous with cryptography. Of course, we see it very differently now. One of the people who came by was uh, John McCarthy. And John McCarthy got interested in the subject and came back out to the lab and chatted us up about it. And several of us got interested in it. I was the only one whose interest persists, uh, persisted, uh, but that is the, the way I got into this business. Six months later, I was working on nothing else. John McCarthy was fed up to his back teeth because I was being supported by under the table money from NSA <laughs> to work on proof of correctness. And he was afraid of an embarrassment. <laughs> and we, we came to a mutually satisfactory agreement. I took an indefinite leave of absence. I set out planning to travel around the world. I got as far as New Jersey where I met Mary Fisher who became my wife. <laughs> and uh, in what we met a year later, we saw Alan Conheim, who was the head of the 
only significant non-governmental photography group in the country at the time. And he said, you should go see my old friend, Marty Hellman, who's out at Stanford. Uh, he had a California sense of old friend. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I came out here and uh, we planned a half hour meeting, which turned into running till 11th night and worked together for four years and became a big pain in Alan Conham's ample tush and uh, developed public key photography. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Wit. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank Rebecca for editing this book. I know that was not a simple matter, and uh, we really needed somebody like with me. with your background and uh, your expertise. So, thank you, and all the people, some of whom are here, uh, who contributed to it, uh, wrote chapters. Thank you very much. Uh, reading it, I learned a lot. Just like today, I mean, I, I never knew about Ruben uh, as a waiter. <laughs> And so the one story I'll tell that Su Susan uh, alluded to is um, um, we were having a major fight with NSA, except it was the joke is NSA stands for no such agency and never say anything, not for national security agency. And in fact, we were not having a fight with NSA. We were having the fight with the National Bureau of Standards, as it was called at the time. But it was two people who'd left NSA. And then in 1978, as this thing had made, become major news, uh, uh, as has been pointed out, I get a call from um, the National Security Agency, um, um, an admin, or secretary as we called them in those days, uh, said, Admiral Inman, the director of NSA, is going to be in California. Would I be willing to meet with him? And I jumped at the opportunity, because finally we get to never sometimes say something <laughs> uh, agency. And he came to my office, uh, Duran 135 in those days. Uh, and um, as he said, uh, the, one of the first things he said was, he looked over at the top of my head and he said, it's nice to see you don't have horns. <laughs> and I looked back at him and I said, same here, because I was in roughly 30 years old at the time, early 30s instead of now. And uh, I, I pictured myself as Luke Skywalker to NSA's Darth Vader. <laughs> and the second thing that Inman told me was, I'm meeting with you against the advice of all the other senior people at the agency, because if I'm the devil incarnate, I mean, if I've got horns on my head, then uh, why talk to him? I'm just going to twist it around. But he said, I don't see the harm in talking. And since then, we've become, we, we started a cautious relationship uh, from that meeting. Uh, and now we are good friends. And he signed several statements of support related to CSAC, like the most recent one is rethinking national security, the need to really rethink the fundamental assumptions that masquerade as self-evident truths. So I really uh, am so grateful to Wit, to all of you and everyone who's been in my life, including my wife who's here today, who put up with all this crap. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'll leave it there for now and we'll turn to questions. Perfect, thank you. So I'll, I'll turn it over to John to moderate. Um, why don't I why don't I start the conversation? But you can insert Zoom uh, Zoom questions. Are there some too? There so, was there's a really quick question. It's oh, okay, two questions. Do, do we want to take them from the? Why don't I there? start and then we'll we'll yeah. we'll, okay. we'll go because so you know there I see three paths here in this conversation. One is about technology. One is about policy, and the other is about history. And before we get to the other two, I wanted to start with wit with history because um, I've written about this over time, and there are all of these invention stories, and you you pick them apart. It, they get fuzzy. It's really hard to pin things down. And there was, a, so when I wrote an earlier book, um, I was very interested in your relationship McCart to McCarthy and the sort of the, the interaction you had with McCarthy that led you thinking to go in a certain direction. And what I took away from a conversation we had in 2000 was McCarthy had been obsessed with this notion of the home terminal. Um, there was stuff in France. He had given a paper in France. Um, I don't think you read the paper, but you had the discussion with him about this notion of commerce becoming electronic. Um, and I think we had a conversation where you said that he talked about the notion of a signature in, a, in an electronic space. And that sort of shifted you from worrying about distributing keys to worrying about how you're going to sign uh, the message. Is that, is that the way it worked? I don't remember his suggesting it. I thought I heard no, no, talk. but he was talking. Talk. About, yeah, I mean, I, I, he, he told us what he'd said in Bordeaux, a town that would later become important to me. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> um, uh, and I began thinking about a couple of interesting things about it. one, John McCarthy had a view that was very similar to ultimately became a Minotaur. And if you're looking at the connections, I'd love to know whether he's whether that talk is an, an origin for the Minotaur in Venice. Yeah. But I invented envisioning an automated office. And what it occurred to me was in offices, you depend so much on signed memos and this, that, and the other, that what you would, what in automating an office, what would you do for signature? And I had the natural block that since we depend so much on the non-reproducibility of written signatures and digital documents are always perfectly copy copyable, I couldn't see how you could do it. And it was five years before I came, you know, came to an answer to that problem along with the key management. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me ask the panel as a whole. Um, you know, we went through this period, 2015, 2016, where there was a direct clash between Apple and the FBI. Uh, it kind of evaporated. Um, uh, the FBI made their way around Apple. Um, uh, uh, are the crypto wars, as they were called, over, or will they reemerge? So. Um... <laughs> I, I was sitting in testimony at uh, in, in before Congress, and I got a, a, Director Comey had already left, but I certainly got the New York DA very mad at me as I was speaking. So, um, no, they haven't uh, departed. So, what the Apple F so the the original crypto wars were over uh, encrypt end to end encryption, uh, encrypting communication. Uh, in when the NSA backed down over encryption export controls in the late 1990s, uh, in large part because many other nations, not just the technically sophisticated ones, but many others were, were encrypting their communications because certain types of encryption had made things very inexpensive. Um, and they got money instead from Congress for computer network exploitation. Um, NSA backed down on that, FBI was not happy because that meant that there was going to be encryption uh, within the United States. Now, it took a long time. We expected it. We guys expected it to happen in a couple of years. And it was 15 years, 10 years before it happened. And FBI had got, law enforcement had gotten very accustomed to taking devices and pulling data off of them. In fact, it wasn't till, um, I'm not going to remember if it's the Jones court case or which court case it is, but it's not for a while before you have to get a warrant to search a, a phone. Um, you can search. Uh, you can search a, uh, 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 someone you arrest, their pockets, if they have a knife and so on. A phone is not something that can actually hurt a police person. So, so, um, so the FBI was very upset through the 2000s about the loss of, of export controls on end-to-end -end encryption because they were worried, constantly worried about issues of not being able to understand communications. When Apple started encrypting devices, which is late 2000s um, due to theft of devices and so on, and then theft of identity off the devices, uh, FBI got really upset there. They backed in, they, what happened next is they backed down a little post the Snowden uh, disclosures because everybody backed down and then came back with a roar in 2015, 2016. Um, what also happened then is that the targets from the 19, in the 1990s, it was kidnappers, terrorists, drug dealers, and organized crime. Uh, Witt and I in our book pointed out that of the 500 or so kidnappings a year, only a few of them actually uh, were wiretapped and therefore that argument didn't actually make sense. Uh, so kidnapping dropped out of the picture, but uh, terrorism, organized crime, and drug dealers stayed. In 2017 or 18, after, uh, Chris Ray became FBI director. All of a sudden, you hear about uh, CSAM, child sexual abuse material. And it was not something that the FBI had been willing to, to put forward. It felt that it was a too emotional, uh, it seems it felt that it was too emotional a topic. And it would just change the debate from a serious debate to just a very heated emotional one. Um, you see, in, in since 2000, it's very hard to find any national security person in the US arguing for controls on encryption. Instead, you get op-eds in the Washington Post and various other places where they actually say, um, 
then widespread use of encryption is, uh, is important for national security. You have Chertoff saying it, you have Inman saying it, you have, you have lots of people saying it. You have in Europe a real push to control encryption and the argument is often TSAM, child sexual abuse material. Um, but um, they don't say they want to control child, they don't say they want to control encryption. They say we need to investigate child sexual abuse material. Um, I could go on about child sexual abuse material, but then I would be taking this. Well, let me do the one more sentence. It's not child sexual abuse material. It's really child sexual abuse and exploitation. And once you break that problem up into four pieces, um, you start investigating it in lots of different ways and encryption is only part of the problem. Um, but, but, but it's a complicated dance and it's, it, it's changed a lot, it's morphed. Are you good? Comment, uh, the, um, it's interesting that NSA is no longer arguing for uh, a, a weak encryption uh, for the law enforcement groups. But um, one of the things law enforcement constantly says is we want to go back to the good old days when we got a court ordered wiretap, we could, you know, listen in. The thing is, in the good old days, they only had probably 1% of the raw data that they get today. They didn't have license plate readers. They didn't have surveillance cameras that would record. Well, even a wiretap, they didn't have, they didn't have caller ID yes. instant, instantly yes. available. Right. So I don't know what the numbers are, but if, if, if today law enforcement is getting 100 times more raw data than they got in the good old days, even if half of it's encrypted, they're still getting 50 times more uh, useful data but they're also being stymied with an equal amount of time under those assumptions. And I can, my, my heart goes out to them when they have a real criminal case, I wish they could get in. But as um, Ron Rivest and the others in uh, Keys Under Doormat, were some of you involved in that? Yeah. Uh, they have a report, Keys Under Doormat, that there's no way to make it, uh, they can give access to law enforcement without also protecting criminals and so forth. Right. Right. Just like cars. I mean, there's no currently existing or uh, uh, introduced legislation to bring it back, though. I mean, appear um, I suspect from all the public statements that you get, you don't get any active NSA person stating that um, that. Well, actually, that's not true. There is a a leaked document from 2015 from the Obama administration looking at the possibility for doing controls on encryption. And it talks about the cost to Silicon Valley, the cost to all sorts of things, including security. And it, it's clear that the middle option of doing nothing is what was taken. Yeah. There was, under Trump, uh, there was more interest by, by the DOJ and FBI to do controls on encryption. There, uh, but reading the tea leaves from NSA, it's not, the support isn't there. And, and I suspect part of it is post Snowden, um, whenever NSA had to go up to the Hill to testify, FBI sat behind them at the table. And so they're not gonna stab FBI in the back, but this is a, I suppose, as opposed to. Why don't we invite a question from. Can, uh, I, can yeah, I just ask yeah. a quick two finger on this, this particular question? So, and also tying together some of the comments that have been made. So there was a shift in the 1990s, right? And we've heard about how NSA the national security institutions of the United States were very opposed to having widespread strong cryptography. And then there was a shift where export controls on cryptography were more or less lifted in the 1990s. And that shift seems to have happened right around the same time that the developments that Andre described were taking place, where finally you had all of these pieces in place that you could have widespread electronic commerce. Was there any relationship between those two things? I mean, what was part of the reversal of the policy or the lifting of these export controls about the profitability that was suddenly realizable by having these technologies widespread, so globally what, available? What you got in the late 1990s was um, there were a whole bunch of bills that got introduced in Congress. Uh, uh, I don't remember if there were any bills from Silicon Valley. There was certainly a bill from Washington State uh, from Cantwell that was introduced that we're going to lift the uh, encryption controls. I, did McCain introduce one? I don't even remember. Sorry, uh, it's in our book. It's I in our papers. Of memory. Uh, <laughs> um, but there were a whole lot of bills that were introduced in Congress. So you get NSA realizing that the encryption controls are no longer as viable as they had been because of lots of nations using encryption anyway. You also get um, that there are these bills in Congress and you get that NSA wants money for computer network exploitation because it, it can't, 
And it, it's also the case that computer network exploitation, knowing who is communicating with whom when, is for many instances, Al Qaeda investigations, ISIS investigations, may actually be more valuable than knowing what they're saying. So NSA is interested in making a trade. The other part of making a trade is if you make a trade, if you go to the White House and say, we'll, hold, we'll, we'll stop objecting to uh, control, uh, to encryption being exported, um, is if NSA gets to get the export role, rules changed, then NSA can shape them. So if a congressional bill is gonna say, get rid of them. But the change that happened in, in um, saying it very simply is there were no controls except on commercial equipment, on, um, uh, sorry, on, on, on co uh, commit, uh, com uh, equipment, equipment sold to governments, to telephone service providers, or to service providers, and custom-made equipment. That's the kind of equipment that NSA was interested in looking at. Those still had to go under export controls, nothing else did. And so, so NSA got what it wanted and it made Silicon Valley happy. So it was a, a real win-win for NSA and it was not, the, the bills went away. Mm -hmm. There are a number of things that contribute to the lifting of export controls. And one of them, I don't know how important, but it, I think it played a role was the National Research Council, National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine study, in which I participated in the mid 90s that included Benjamin Civiletti, a former Attorney General representing law enforcement interests, Ann Tara Christie, a former uh, Deputy Director at NSA representing their interests. And this was a fantastic study. We, re we reached a consensus in spite of us having so many different perspectives. And we concluded that we needed to lift a lot, of, we needed to greatly uh, alleviate export controls. Uh, and I remember the conversations that led to that. And very soon after that study happened, although today I'm realizing that the internet was also happening and people were making money, which is another factor as well. Right? But at least I think we did it. <laughs> and, and I want to go back to answer John just one more minute. There was a Carnegie study in which I participated in 2018, part of the Endowment for International Peace, that, was, that looked at the whole issue of encryption. And it decided to look at a case that looked like the most ripe one to think about. And national security wasn't complaining, so we were only gonna look at what law enforcement was complaining. Law enforcement was complaining about mobile devices, it was complaining. That's the point of thinking about only mobile phones and could, could we come up with a way to get data off mobile phones in a way that would not make everybody else insecure, just the target insecure and so on and so forth. In that report, one of the striking things it says is that the, the, the encryption issue is not a security versus privacy issue, but it's a security versus national security versus uh, public safety versus blah, 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 versus privacy. Mm -hmm. The signers to that report include Chris Inglis, who is uh, Biden's uh, cyber advisor. It includes um, uh, Avril Haynes, who is the director of national intelligence. It includes Lisa Monaco, who's the second in charge in the Department of Justice. Uh, those people signed on to this report. So, so you really see support at high levels in the government for widespread use of encryption. Let me bring in the audience. Um, so if there are questions from, from, yes, and then those two questions, you, you first. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Rihanna Nielsen. I'm the cybersecurity fellow here at CSAC. Uh, thank you so much for your panel. It was a really fascinating discussion. My question is maybe a little bit more oriented toward the social sciences, but it was something that Professor Landau raised. Um, you talk about how a lot of the development of public key was recognizing a problem in advance and responding to it. There's, so it seems to be an element of cautiousness in this approach, at least in the, in the 70s. Not to date myself, but I grew up in the era of Zuckerberg um, <laughs> and in Silicon Valley, there seems to be this approach of move fast and break things. Um, what happened? Like, wh what happened in that space where, where engineers seem to develop these tools and not give that much foresight to the ways in which these new technologies could precipitate some really egregious effects? Thank you. There's, there's, there's clearly um, a culture um, I, you know, I commend everybody to, I, I, I was being deadly serious about web 3.0 is going just great.com. It's, it's simply a reporter who keeps track of um, failures in the cryptocurrency world and they're legion. I mean, it's remarkable to me. Here we have this technology that's supposed to protect information uh, and the, here they have these 
emergence of these systems for protecting digital assets, and it seems that none of them work. None of them. <laughs> and we're moving on from protecting digital assets to, assets to protecting um, economic interactions, the notion of digital contracts and trustless interaction, and the infrastructure is so weak. It's unbelievably weak. And so the, the question, I mean, what, um, is it an engineering culture that's flawed or is the technology inherently flawed? I, I, I'm not sure I, I have a good answer. Uh, okay, let me let me make clear that I uh, I would answer that, but only on, that's my point of view. I'm not representing Google in any way or shape. Um, so I think that the most of the the problems uh, come from uh, misunderstanding the definition. Why a particular cryptographic scheme does one thing and it does very well within the assumption of the model. And this is something that you also see in science, you know, you see paper in economics that uh, are very convincing and very accurate mathematical within the assumption of the model. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, to give you an example from economics, you can say, well, you know, you have the sellers and the buyers and, and you know, maybe you have a system that's uh, incentive compatible, so the sellers has an incentive to to actually uh, uh, the uh, the buyer has an incentive to actually tell the actual the value of the buyer. You know, auctions are like that. You should you should give your value and so on. But those are within the confine of the model. This do not include the buyer, you know, kidnapping your kid and, <laughs> and saying, you know, if the price is higher than $3 for this gizmo on eBay, your kid is kissed, right? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's within a model. So cryptography and, and a lot of the cryptocurrencies things are based on assumption of the model. You know, FTX didn't go bankrupt because uh, the uh, contract was somehow were broken and so on. It's because, because they were, you know, doing very old fashioned kind of uh, <laughs> stealing money in a bank by simply uh, abusing whatever authorities they were granted. So, uh, so I think the technology <laughs> uh solves the problem correctly uh it is where you try to use a technology in a way that was not intended and outside the confines of the model that all bets are off and uh, it's no point in blaming the technology or saying the technology is bad you know the technology is uh, is doing what it was designed to do uh but it does not, you know, it does not protect you from those risks. <laughs> Just so, a, oh, go ahead, then I'll. So, but I also want to say that you're asking a social question. So uh, you're too young, but Microsoft was a real bad guy in the 90s. Microsoft, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Microsoft would look at people's inventions and they would take the protocol and they would tweak it just a little bit. It's called embrace and extend. And then because so many people were using a Microsoft product, it wouldn't interoperate with the original product and the embrace and extended version would be patented by Microsoft. Lots of antitrust actions against Microsoft. Enron is another example of a mess from, from that period. So it's not that during the 90s, all of us were moral and, and now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's another piece to it too, which I think there has been a change in Silicon Valley in really interesting ways, which is if you go back 30 or 40 years, people would, uh, we worked for a company that built servers. We didn't actually build servers. We wrote patents and then somebody else built the servers, but we were building servers, we were building chips, we were building infrastructure uh, for which electrical engineers with BSs were needed, BSs and MSs. Now, many of the software engineers are younger. Some of them didn't finish college. And I really think that if you're going to think about impact, you read novels and you read history. And there is um, there's there's a, there's less education in them, and so there's more of a and less humanistic education because if they're going too fast, where that happens. So there's there's it's not the case we were moral then and we are moral now, but it's also a case that there's a different 
group of people doing things with a different education level. So um, you're raising the move fast and break things uh, credo. And it's really interesting now, if you look at the Valley's culture, there's another adjacent moment um, that is, I think, enlightening in, 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 in response. Um, you know, about a, a decade ago, Silicon Valley began a very serious conversation about ethics surrounding artificial intelligence. Um, they evoked a Silomar, they went to a Silomar, they agonized over um, you know, the singularity and everything else. They set up institutions that they, you know, HAI, I was a fellow at HAI, human centered uh, computing. Um, and then somebody put five bucks on the table and they literally broke their back uh, in terms of the race to get um, large language models, chatbots into the market because they saw that a, a monopoly that existed for a couple of decades was now vulnerable. And there was a race, there is a race on for a new choke point um, where you will set up toll gates and monetize. And so that, that entire debate, um, as you can see already that chatbots are, are, are having a, a wealth of, of interesting uh, sociological uh, problems are emerging around chatbots. It's a fascinating time, but that ethical debate seems to be um, you know, put on the shelf. Um, other thoughts before, go ahead, go ahead and ask. Yes, oh, yes, <laughs> sorry. Hi, my name is Julie George. I'm a pre-doctoral fellow here at CSAC and at the Institute for Human-Centered AI. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. I've learned so much, especially about the historical understanding of cryptography. My question is about the future of cryptography. Could you spend a little bit in explaining where you think that's going and what issues we should be mindful of, especially when it comes to national security? Thank you. Uh, what's the future of cryptography and what should we be concerned about with national security? Can I pile on a, a quick question from the, the Zoom that seems linked to this? Maybe answer them together which is the question of whether quantum, uh, the question of whether quantum research will affect cryptography, accelerate research and development of cryptography. Great cryptography I know is a concern. So maybe we can join that too. Um, let me start by, okay. Let me start by saying I have a slightly different view of something that happened around 1990 at NSA, <clears throat> which is the shift to network exploitation. And my view of it is, you could turn gray while you're waiting for your opponents to say what you want to know on a channel that you know how to exploit. But you might very well know that it's in a database somewhere. And if you're willing to take the risk of going and breaking into the database, you can get it much more readily. So I think intelligence has undergone an inherent shift from the value of, of cryptanalysis on signals to, to a much more complex network penetration architecture. Um, it, I, I assume that the current efforts to find uh, quantum computing resistant e functional equivalents of what we have in public key cryptography will succeed. My worry is that the costs will be higher. And a lot of the characteristics of a network depend on what the costs are. So this might lead to a lot more caching of keys and things like that, which change or ought to change the <coughs> risk models and make activity less flexible. I'd like to add on, on uh, quantum that if I were NSA or NIST, which has to design, develop, develop standards for the non-national security agencies, I definitely uh, be doing quantum resistant crypto in part because it's not just the day-to-day -day transactions you want to keep secret, but you're keeping your, you want to keep certain communications secret for 50 years. And it takes a while to, to replace a crypto system. So if you put out a new standard in 10 years um, and it takes 20 years for it to be widely used, and it's, you have data that you wanna protect, or you're talking about, we better do it now. In fact, we better do it yesterday. Uh, that argument is contrasted with the other argument, which is you can see, I don't know if Wit has gray hairs, but I certainly do. Uh, <laughs> um, but 
I've been hearing that we're going to have quantum computing 10 or 15 <laughs> years say. from now since I was a graduate student. And um, the physics is pretty hard. Yeah. Uh, so I think NSA and NIST are doing absolutely the right thing, but I'm not terribly worried about quantum computing is, is the answer. Yeah, there's a, there's a tremendous hype factor right now around quantum computing. And um, quantum computing has a noise problem. Um, and they really have to solve the noise problem before they um, can do useful things like break today's crypto systems. Did, did we answer your question, Julie? Because I realized I kind of piled on the quantum question. Was that in line with what you were thinking? Okay. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, you know, is it that narrow? Are there other technologies? Um, I mean, for example, I always wonder if there is anybody proposed anything besides splitting the key to solving this deeper problem. Is there is there anything on the horizon technologically? Putting the key in the public key sense, or in the yeah. key sharing sense? Yeah, in the key sharing sense to, to try to, to- It seems to, to me what, what the public cryptographic community has done is um, beginning with Shafi and Silvio, uh, like three years after we published, came up with a new form of problem. And now they, you know, the, so to speak, the late, the two latest big ones are, are blockchains and um, fully homomorphic computing. But also, you know, as far as I can see, cryptography is a healthy field in the sense that it's a big source of new problems. So I think part of the answer, John, to your question is that as we are more and more embedded in the digital world, there are more and more functionalities we might want from encryption. And if you think about disinformation, are there ways of proving that the file that's released, all the contents in it really came from, from the people who were communicating or, and so you can create problems to look at. And then the question is, is the algorithm believable? Will, public pe will people believe the data that's coming? So, so I think as we're more embedded in the digital world, there are more problems, but they become more arcane. And even if there are cryptographic solutions, it's not entirely clear that they will get adapted because it's not clear that the problems they're solving are considered important enough or the solutions recognized enough by the people who need to recognize them as being valuable. And that's hard for me to tell. Other questions from the audience? I, you know, I, I, um, Susan, I, one recent, you know, you talked about these different categories, uh, terrorism, uh, kidnappers, CSAM. Recently, um, you can add to that sedition, I believe, in an interesting way. Um, uh, there is a debate around January 6th. Um, apparently, uh, Oath Keepers were using, I believe, Signal, not Telegram. Um, and the Justice Department got access to a wealth of their communications. And it's sort of an, maybe I may not be following this close enough because I haven't been reporting on it, but it was unclear how the Justice Department got the plain tests of the messages, but they did get them. Uh, they may have gotten them from somebody who was party to the, to the message and just gave it to them, but they may have also gotten it in some technical way. Uh, do you, have you followed this? Uh, I haven't followed it. My impression was that they got it off the phone of somebody who was part of the communication yeah, system. Is, yeah. And, and that is somebody who had stored the, the responses. I think that like, like many, other, many other systems, again, this is going outside the parameters, right? Telegram is, is very cryptographically secure, but not if you have an informant. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, something in, uh, in my life somewhat, uh, somewhat similar is that various captchas that get more and more complicated and, and you know they're provable that would require more computing resources and so on but it's very cheap to simply uh, you know that, pay pay some people in in the well, uh, in philippines <laughs> or or in some place where they speak english that's that's important uh and they will do it you know for one dollar per thousand so so the cost is actually actually much lower. And that reminds me of a John McCarthy story, which I have to tell at this juncture. Most people don't know that John McCarthy, who was the inventor of the term artificial intelligence and multi, uh, multitasking, uh, multi-user operating system, all kinds of things, was also, for much of his young life, a member of the Communist Party. And um, 
And uh, he was actually, when he was here first as a mathematician at, at Stanford in the 50s, before he came back, young, um, he was a member of the party. And of course, the Communist Party was always organized into secret cells. And the story McCarthy told me that he was then went to Princeton and he was a member of the party and there were only three people in, in the party cell. There was McCarthy, there was a black cleaning woman and there was the informer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> To your point about the lease costs, I'm slightly off topic, but but uh, other thoughts? Yes. So uh, I heard the microphone. Yeah, I'm Jim Harris, and I'm a colleague of Marty's in the EE department, um, and um, also one of my postdocs and a graduate student were the first ones to demonstrate Shor's algorithm with quantum computing, and so I've sort of followed this that was far, far away from 95% of whatever I did technically. But uh, what I see is it's just, um, as, you, as the point was made, a huge issue is who's the message from and who's it to? Because I think that it takes long enough to decrypt, even with the most advanced kinds of things, long enough that you're only, only going to manage to decrypt, you know, one out of 100 million things out there or something like that. So if you pick a specific one from who it's from and who it's to, uh, it certainly can be done. But uh, trying to, you know, mass decryption, I think uh, I could easily be wrong. Who knows what happens in 50 years? But I've seen, you know, the progress over the last 20 years slow enough that uh, I, I think it, it's going to be restricted to very small numbers of things. You, there's apparently a technical question on. Well, I don't know how technical it is, but I, I'm going to ask anybody who answers this to explain it since this is a general audience. Um, this question was posed actually fairly early in the seminar, um, and it came from Richard C. Brand, who said that secure communications over shared IP networks is an oxymoron. I was a member of IEEE 802.1 uh, standards um, com, uh, where we tried to achieve this goal. What has changed to make you all believe we have? can achieve this goal. So if anybody wants to take that, feel free. Um, I just want to put that out there since it is here. And if, if you don't, that's OK. Well, is it any worse than the ether? I mean, people believe in secure communication all over radio channels. I don't see the uh, internet as any worse than that. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on what you mean by secure communication. If what you mean by secure communication is end-to-end -end encrypted, that's one thing. If what you mean by secure communication is hiding who the endpoints are, that's a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do the panelists have um, any thoughts about Elon Musk's recent entry into this security question? I, I think this, uh, this touches on cryptographic stuff in the sense that, I don't know, are you aware that he, he Musk has uh, recently um, changed the rules at Twitter so that you're going to have to pay to have two-factor authentication in the future. That would be one of the, the things that you get if you have a blue check mark. If you don't, you're, you're stuck with just your password. And it's, some people have actually suggested that, um, that he's moving toward an authenticator system and may ultimately be more secure, but it, clearly he's, he's creating a, a system of Twitter, uh, uh, you know, hierarchy of Twitter users where some are secure and, and, and some are less secure. And, and, and of the many interesting things he's done recently. Right. So you're moving to a model in, in which uh, you can't trust that the tweet is from the person who. Well, that's, uh, that's, yeah. uh, and, and so from, that makes Twitter less. Alleging you can. Yeah. It makes Twitter less useful, more noisy, less useful, but maybe that's the model he. Uh, Am I, I being would, too sarcastic? I would tend I would tend to disagree. I mean, you you prefer to to know that the communication is from the person right, but you know, and I think that even small financial incentive can have a fairly big uh, impact. I mean, you know, if if we could, and at this point, no one would do that. But assume that you can put a one cent cost on an email stamp, you know? So you want to send email or I can put, I say, you know, I don't receive any mail unless you paid one cent. This will cut spam 
immediately. immediately. This was yeah. Bill Gates' idea a long time right. ago. Long ago, <laughs> right. I'm not, not claiming, I'm not claiming, uh, claiming right, but I'm just, just giving this because this is a standard example where, you know, we, I mean, a lot of, I think a lot of uh, fake identities are driven by financial incentives, right? That, uh, you know, you get all this, I don't know, on Twitter, fake invites from attractive individuals in the hopes that you, you know, one, one in a thousand will get answered then one in a hundred thousand will send some money to uh, some strange address, uh, you know, to get married <laughs> with this, uh, uh, you know, beautiful person. So, uh, right, and to get what you so once you do that, and that because the chances of at least of those schemes to succeed is so small, once there is a cost to put such a scheme in in place, all those schemes will fail. So in this in this respect, will be better. Of course, you run into the problem. What about a poor person in India for which whatever uh, the authentication cost is a high cost? So I think that such scheme in so far as you might have some kind of uh, differential pricing, they, they might work from a social point of view, but I'm certainly no, no expert. But it really, what he's really talking about is changing the business model. And so to follow up on Andre's point about the, the spam that you know, one in a thousand might respond and one in a hundred thousand might sign up. I remember a paper at the workshop for economic, uh, of econ workshop in economics of information security, pointing out that the poorly worded, attractive things that people get in spam, it's not a mistake that they're poorly worded because the people who will respond to the poorly worded ones are the people who will actually buy into them. And writing them well, you'll get more people expressing interest, but then as they follow up, they realize that no, this is not something they want. And so the spammer loses money by having a better framed. <laughs> Scott, don't look at me so surprised. Is there, is there any evidence? I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, oh, yes, yeah. Yes, make, it actually makes sense. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, yeah no, the, this was a, a serious, I think Richard Clayton was probably involved the, in it. The only, uh, <laughs> the only things that, uh, I mean, I know, I know more about that, but I can talk, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you, you know, you uh, certainly the the spammers are are more sophisticated uh, these days than you would than, think. Than you'd think, and certainly this is a filter in order to reduce their cost because ultimately they need to have some humans uh, answering. On the other hand, if you are too repetitive or too clear about that, then the automatic spam filters will kill the message. At least if you use a decent mail service, it will kill before it gets to you. So they no doubt have some system of optimization, uh, you know, using uh, maybe classical alphabet pruning <laughs> that McCarthy would have appreciated <laughs> and, and figure out, you know, what words, uh, what words to use. Although the real spamming and, and phishing schemes are much more sophisticated though, than that. Those are really amateurs at this point. <laughs> I wanted to ask you um, your cold start point about technologies gathering adoption. There's one now that's being uh, proposed by uh, Apple, Google, and other major companies, which is called Passkeys. And it's got kind of a cold start situation. Are you optimistic about this? Is a technology that basically takes passwords, human entered passwords, out of the equation and is, in theory, yeah. Uh, I think there is a there is a chance because because this is not so much of a cold start. I mean, because already there is a, a huge installed base. So in so far as everyone comes into an agreement and everything happens at once, you will have a huge installed base, and hopefully the system will be frictionless. So you know the vast majority of consumers will say, hey, you know there is this new. Uh, Passkey that somehow appeared on my browser and, and seems to manipulate and you know all my stored passwords move to these new systems. I think this will will be a, a problem. You know that will start from a large enough uh, group that it will succeed. But but uh, this you has know. been the obvious thing to do for a long time, and nonetheless it, it's a standards matter and such. Right. And the basic notion is instead of sending a password out over the web, you use it maybe to unlock a local utility 
which is cryptographic, and then you have more com complex cryptographic protocols for authenticating yourself that way. That's been the obvious thing to do since everybody began to have a computer rather than a dumb terminal. But it's just taken a long time somehow to, to get it, you know, maybe they'll get it to work this time. And, and there are some new schemes that seem to be quite successful and they are depending also of the, of the fact that everyone now has an incredibly powerful pocket, you know, in computer. the super computer by the standards of our graduate days yeah. for sure, right? So, you know, so uh, uh, many high security things require two-factor authentication, but it's not that they send you a message, you have, a, you have a, a, something generated on your phone and you enter it, right? And all this dialogue can be automatic. I don't know if, if the phone is safe enough, that's a different, different question itself. And, and many people do not realize how not having a powerful enough password on their phone unlocks essentially all their financial <laughs> life and, and everything. Like, says, you know, I need a, a powerful, I mean, many people seem to think I need a powerful password on, on Fidelity. But, you know, one, two, three, four is good enough to unlock my, my phone, right? And <laughs> if I lose it, oh, well. <laughs> Thank you, so, everyone. Uh, I think we, no, do you want to? Go, go ahead. I didn't well, I was just saying that the social factors and cultural factors are, are what destroys uh, cryptographic protocols, not the excellent cryptography that those guys are creating. We are at time, so we should conclude. But if anybody has questions, please come up. We have a few minutes that we can chat. And thank you all for sharing your wealth of knowledge and experience. Thank you. <laughs>